Welcome to the Illustrator Studio. I am Jesse Kowalski, Curator of Exhibitions at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. The Illustrator Studio is a weekly interview series, a project of the museum's Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies. In this episode of the Illustrator Studio, we welcome Lewis Henry Mitchell, Creative Director of Character Design at Sesame Workshop, the home of Sesame Street. A lifelong fan of the Muppets, Lewis actually began his career illustrating for comic book legend Neil Adams. Lewis joined the staff of Sesame Workshop in 1992, and in 2000, he was hired in a more senior role, and uh, he has never left. Uh, Lewis, welcome to the Illustrator Studio. Uh, thanks, Jesse. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, no, so you and I met last summer, summer uh, 2019. I was right. curating an exhibition on illustration in the year 1969, uh, because that was the year, it was the 50th anniversary in the Norman Rockwell Museum and the 50th anniversary of Sesame Street, of course. Absolutely. And Sesame Street and the Muppets have been a big part of my life. And uh, so that's why I wanted to include a, a larger section uh, in the exhibition. And uh, I really wanted to have a Muppet there. And so we were lucky enough to get uh, Cookie Monster in the exhibition. My favorite. My yeah, and so you, so you traveled to the museum. You uh, came there with your grooming kit, right? And you uh, <laughs> you fixed Cookie Monster up. And uh, now I, I, you know, instantly I just uh, thought you were such a great guy, and uh, you know oh, you cared you. so much about the about your job and everything. And I remember when you got to the museum, you know, you had this light in your eyes, like you were really happy. So, uh, what was going through your mind when you got to the Rockwell? Well. He means so much to me. There's really no way to describe it. And since I've become a member of the board of trustees, he, it, the interest and the love has grown even further because there were so many things I discovered about him. But the thing is that when I was 16 years old, I went walked to this bookstore and saw this book. It was the Norman Rockwell book, uh, Norman Rockwell Illustrated, not the big one, but the smaller one mm -hmm. by Watson and Gupta. And um, I was just flipping through and I couldn't believe my eyes. It, were, it wasn't that it looked photographic. They looked like they were really there. I mean, it wasn't like a photograph. It was like a human being in the book. And I just fell in love with them. And that was very early on in my, in my maybe the second week of high school, I discovered oh. them and that was it. So to be able to walk into the, the museum and see those original pieces of artwork, and there's nothing like seeing the originals. I mean, it's beautiful to see the covers and, and the pictures in the books, but to actually walk up and then I mean, you can't get too close. So, uh, I mean, um, I've been asked to step back a couple of times. And I, don't, I don't mind because, again, I, I'm trying to be respectful, yeah. but those are sacred artifacts. Those were those are pictures that molded me as an artist because like, Mr. Uh -huh. Rockwell just means so much to me. Uh, were there any specific artworks that uh, stand out for you? Wow, that's uh, well, I guess the one that really touched me the most is the triple self portrait. Uh -huh. It's my favorite. It's not that I think it's the best of all of his paintings. It's, how do you do that? But mm -hmm. it's just that it, it depicts him. It's a self portrait of him. Actually, it's not, it's not a triple self portrait because up in the corner there are another, I think, five little sketches of him yeah. in that little piece. <laughs> but um, but no, it's just that the way he depicted himself there. So that's why I remember that drawing that I did, kind of as an homage to that drawing. Yeah. yeah. Prague as, as the artist looking in the mirror and drawing Jim Henson. So you mentioned uh, you're on the board of the museum now. We're th so thrilled to have you. You know, you've got such a, such a great so, mind and uh, so much enthusiasm. It's terrific having you there. Um, so what, what, kind of, what kinds of things do they have you working on? Well, one of the most exciting things was, I mean, of course, I love to attend the, um, the meetings that we have, but um, Stephanie Plunkett, the chief curator, she's just a wonderful, such a wonderful person, and a dear friend now, mm -hmm. but she actually asked me if I would write um, a blog, and then she asked me if I would write a couple of the commentaries for paintings uh, in, in the uh, gallery. Mm -hmm. And... I said, you want me to write? And of course, I just poured my heart and soul into it. And she, and she loved what I, what I had done. So, um, but the thing is, when I did the, she sent me a lot of research material, which I was so, so of course, the curator is going to have all this wonderful, this fodder mm -hmm. for me. But I learned that Mr. Rockwell was a member of the NAACP. Now, the thing is, I did not know. He was a life member. All the things I knew about Norman Rockwell, I have, virtually every book. I have files. I have so many things. I have videos. 
I didn't know that his commitment was that to that degree. And of course, when he was doing the papers for the Saturday Post, he wasn't really allowed to show people of color. Right. You know, I mean, he, every now and then he was able to get something. I think the first one he did, I forgot the date, but it was a little boy. A woman had fallen off her horse and he was standing over pointing, pointing the direction where the horse went. Mm-hmm. I think that was the first time he actually was able to get a person of color. In it. And the thing is, once he left there and he started, you know, in the 60s, he said exploded and started doing all these, you know, the Ruby Bridges painting. And, and um, the problem with Elizabeth, I think, is, is that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, just so many things that he did. And I said, well, that's really something. When I found out that he was a member of the NAACP, one of the, I, I have considered five people my mentors. It's Martin Luther King Jr., Norman Rockwell, Jim Henson, um, Leonardo da Vinci, and Leonard Bernstein. But the two key ones in there, Dr. King and, and um, Norman Rockwell, the first wow. two, they were, Norman Rockwell became a member of the NAACP at the same time that Dr. King was affiliated with it. Mm-hmm. So, and I didn't know that. So she, and I asked her if I could have permission to write an additional commentary focusing on that, because people need to know, you know, the, the right now the museum is, is creating initiatives and programs and even shows that, that kind of talk about inclusion and, you know, talk about how, you know, racism has no place really on this planet. Right. And sometimes if people look at Mr. Rockwell's work, they would think that he, he wasn't really into it that much he, because he painted everybody who was mm-hmm. pretty much, you know, white. Yeah. But the thing is that he wasn't allowed to. Right. When the minute he was, when he was free to do that, he continued, he continued to celebrate people of all nationalities. But in that yeah. particular case, you know, that was, it was just so exciting for me to find out he was a member of the board that made it legitimate. Mm-hmm. So whatever we do at the museum, it started with him and his commitment to the um, NAACP and to humanity at large. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, how old were you when you first saw the Muppets perform? It, it was on the Ed Sullivan show, I believe. Yeah, Ed Sullivan show, I was six <laughs> years old. I was uh, not, I was about a month away from becoming seven, but I was six years old. Wow. And actually, that's why my sixth mentor is me when I was, uh, see if I can get a good. That's great. Uh, <laughs> that's me when I, when I discovered Jim Henson on the Ed Sullivan uh-huh. show. That's and great. that's why I keep that bit because I remember that moment so well. And the whole thing is that, and I, I heard the Muppets so many times, and whenever Ed Sullivan would say, here come the Muppets, I would run and watch the TV. But uh, this one time, he, he had Kermit. Kermit was um, like playing the piano, and there was this, this monster on the side. And eventually, I think the piano became a monster that ate him. But afterwards, um, Ed Sullivan kind of gestured to come to him, uh-huh. and Jim Henson came there. And he had done that many times before, but this time he had Kermit on his hand. Oh yeah, and that's that was it. That's what changed my life. That's I'm you mean a man was doing that, and my head spun into this wonder world that never stopped till this day, and led me to, to where I you know yeah, <laughs> where sure. I am now. <laughs> and what do you find uh, inspiring about the Muppets? Oh my goodness! Well, you know, the more you know about the Muppets, the more you start to see that they each one of them represents, especially the Sesame Street Muppets, not exclusively. But especially those Muppets, because again, um, when I teach character design to people all over the world, because I have to train people all over the world, because you know we have so many multiple uh, co-productions that they have to learn how to. I mean, Elmo is in almost every co-production, so mm. they may have their own walk-around Muppet, but Elmo, Grover, Bert, and Ernie are usually the ones that are in their co-productions as well. So whenever they have to reproduce artwork. They have to be consistent with the way we've established them. So we you know, I teach them how to do that, but I don't teach them so much how to draw them. I teach them who they are. Mm-hmm. So the thing is that they really embody the purity of an emotion. Like Elmo is all about unbridled enthusiasm. He's always inquisitive. He wants to explore everything. He's so excited about life. Mm-hmm. You know, Cookie Monster, my favorite one of all. As passionate as he is about cookies, he would give his last cookie to his friends. He you know. loves his friends more than cookies. So that, that means you can be passionate about something, but you don't have to be a jerk. You can, you know, you can, you can be a loving, <laughs> you know. My favorite one to teach though is Grover because Grover, no matter how many times he makes a mistake, he will never, he's never down on himself. He never stops to say, oh, I'm stupid. I made a mistake. He never, ever does that. The only problem is that he only makes mistakes. Everything yeah. he does is a mistake. <laughs> so thank goodness he's not down on himself. But it's, yeah. these are things that, that show kids, you know what? These are, I mean, we're not really 
making the perfect examples because they are they are you know cartoons in some cases puppets but they do kind of send a signal to a kid like Grover saying don't ever be down on yourself just keep yeah. on trying and they, he adds a sense of humor to it but kids learn you know what and like Cookie Monster yeah I have a cookie but I'm going to share it with you this, I love cookies so much but I, I love you more so here have my, have my last cookie so it's teaching kids you know about how to be excited about life but how to also be a loving human being <laughs> be honest with you. Oh, that's excellent wow um, could you tell me a little bit about your childhood and kind of how you uh, how you grew up and uh, developed into uh, someone who's now uh, w one of the main creative forces at Sesame Street? Oh, thank God. I'm hearing that. Well, <laughs> I attribute every single bit of it to my mother. Now, mm -hmm. my, my poor mom, I should, I should say my poor mom, but <laughs> my mom, um, what, I, was, I was a pretty sweet kid, pretty, you know, pretty quiet. But when I saw Jim Henson and that's so I, I followed uh, Paul Winchell. He's another um, ventriloquist, he's another puppeteer. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I loved his work. I loved Topo Gigio. He was also on the Sunset Show. <laughs> um, I loved Kukla, Fran, and Ali. I'd seen other puppets. Um, oh, what's his name? Um, Chuck McCann uh, was a man that was back in the 60s, I think in the 50s as well. And um, I can't remember the name of the puppet. Oh, Paul Ashley. Paul Ashley puppets. Beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful puppets. All exciting, but it wasn't until I saw the Muppets that's when that thing happened to me. So my mother saw that something clicked, mm -hmm. and she was you know, she didn't know how exactly to help me, but she just immersed me in anything that I wanted to do after that. And of course, it was all about drawing and puppets and you know the music and things like that. You know, I see a piano back there. I told myself I had to play the piano because a girl broke my heart in junior high school. And I wandered <laughs> into the music room. And just started figuring out Elton John songs. It just kind of happened. Mm -hmm. And I asked mom if she'd get me a, buy a piano. I had never told her that I was learning. She said, "Why do you want a piano?" I said, "Well, mom, it's because I, you know, I, I just love piano." She said, well, "I can't afford a piano." Little did I know that when I walked away, she made a deal with the with the piano guys, the piano store guy. I come home one day and the piano's there. So it was really because of this great mom that I had. Yeah, she passed away about three years ago, but she was 98 years old. It was on her turn, so she mm -hmm. had a full, beautiful life. She got to see me, you know, achieve my dream job. And again, I was told a lot by a lot of people I wasn't going to make it, but she said, the one thing she always said, don't pay attention, just keep going, just keep going. That's all I needed to hear. So even wow. though I was kind of a shy kid, um, I really remember when she said that. So whenever somebody told me I couldn't do something, even though I might have heard, but I didn't let it stop me. I just kept going, like she said. As a matter of fact, I even have a note to keep on my desk here that from my mom's st statement. Just keep going. That's great. <laughs> wow, she sounds like an amazing woman. And yeah. it sounds like you're really carrying on the tradition of building up self-esteem in children. And uh, that's really wonderful. Yeah. Well, the thing is, the kids, you don't have to build their self-esteem. You have to protect it because yeah. they already, they have a sense of that they're special already. And people start to chisel away at that and that's usually what we see when people start mm -hmm. telling children they can't do this and they can't do that and that happens a lot you know a lot of kids you know they they have this buoyancy to me like you saw that picture of me when I was six years old that's still me and mm -hmm. um, thank goodness my mother protected me back then because that's what gave me the ability to reach out and express myself as, as an artist to, you know, to this day how many people you know were, were stifled from their dream of becoming an artist of becoming anything that usually I really believe a lot of people discover that when they're kids, that that whatever it is they're supposed to be doing somehow is either hinted or revealed in their childhood somehow. But mm -hmm. a lot of times people just start distracting them, discouraging them and derailing them really. And then uh, at the age of 17, uh, you started working for uh, Neil Adams. So yes. for those who don't know, Neil Adams is one of the most important comic book artists of our time. Um, in the early 70s, he really revolutionized the look and feel of Batman. Uh, for me, you know, taking this 1960s kind of whimsical Batman and putting him into this more solemn kind of Dark Knight figure that we see today. Uh, so how did you get started working with Neil at such a young age? Well, again, I was such a fan forever. You know, when I saw that book that I, you know, that comic book, you see the post, the that image of it back there. Mm -hmm. It was Green Lantern and Green Arrow number 85. It's called Snowbirds No Fly. It was the drug issue. Very, very 
be controversial, but very successful. And, um, and it really brought attention to this problem. But it wasn't just that. The artwork in there was just so amazing. I, I didn't understand. I was 11 years old and I'd seen many comic books, but I'd never seen anybody put that kind of effort into a comic book. I felt like I was looking at a movie. And um, so I started copying his work, you know, trying to become an artist. I didn't know Norman Rockwell, about Norman Rockwell yet. Mm -hmm. But I saw Neil Adams and that was like the beginning of it. Actually, Norman Rockwell happens to be Neil Adams' favorite artist. <laughs> but um, mine too. But uh, I was copying his work and trying to learn how to draw like him. I said, this guy is so good. So then I'm just joking around with my friends in my mom's basement. You know, my friends would all come there. Really three of us, but a few of them come, but a few of us were artists, were aspiring artists. And I would say, you know, one day Neil Adams is going to ink my pencil drawings, which is how comic books work. You know, <laughs> one person pencils them, somebody else inks them, and then someone will colors them, and someone letters them. So I said, one day Neil Adams is going to ink, ink my pencil drawings. And of course, we laughed. I laughed too. I was, that was when I was 13 years old when I said that. Wow. Then there was, there was, a, there was a, a comic book store called the New York Comic Art Gallery. And I went, that was in high school at this point. I was 16. And I went in there and I couldn't believe my eyes because they, they had a little bit of original artwork. I had never seen original comic book artwork. It wasn't Neil, but it was anything. I'd never seen anything before. Sure. And they had all these other books. And I was just, I said, please, I have to work here. I was begging the guy to let me work. He said, look, I just opened. I can't afford to, to pay you anything. He said, I don't care. I'll work for free. I have to be here. <laughs> Eventually, I talked him into it. But my mother told me to get him to pay me something. So he was able to pay me comic books at first. Then it became a little bit of cash in the ground, but I didn't care because I got to see all these wonderful things I would never have seen before. Anyway, he, one day I went in there and he was such a good, Mark Rindner is his name. And um, he said, you know, Lewis, I, I, I don't want to give you up, but because you've been so great and you've been working here. He, I, my main job was to make sure the kids didn't steal the comic books. And I sat down <laughs> and I was hated. In high school, because the kids were the kids were able to kind of sneak every now and then and take some yeah. books. I was like a hawk watching them to make sure they didn't take anything, and he loved it. I didn't care if they didn't like me. I was working at the New York Comic Art Gallery. <laughs> but then one day I come in, and he says, "You know, Lewis, you I really love your work. You're really, really good." And um, a friend of mine is looking for an assistant, and I want to introduce you to him. You know, if you're interested, in, you know, he works in the comic book field. I, I said, "Oh my gosh, I always wanted to find a way to get into it somehow." So I said. That'd be great. Who is he? And he said, well, his name is Howard Chaykin. Howard Chaykin is famous for doing the very first Star Wars comic books, among yeah. other things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I didn't like Howard Chaykin's art back then. I love it now. But back then, I didn't, it's like the Picasso. I didn't understand Picasso's work back when I was yeah. a kid. I, I thought he couldn't draw. <laughs> but, but with uh, Howard Chaykin, I said, but you know what? Maybe I don't like his work, but he is in the comic book industry. Maybe he can help me. So I went into, I took the job. He liked me very much. And, you know, he's very funny, very, you know, really good guy. I, I learned a lot of different things. He learned a little bit about business with him, which I had never touched on. But then one day he's, I come in and he says, hey, Lewis, you know what? Uh, the first Friday of every month, all the comic book artists get together and in New York City, and we have a kind of a party. It's called the First Friday Party. And would you like to come to the next one? I said, are you? Yeah, I would love that. I said, I'm going to get to meet all these other artists. Then he says the magic words. Oh, by the way, this was going to be at Neil Adams' house. <laughs> now, at that point, I kind of got nervous. I said, because Neil, look, he's great. And his standards are so high that he, he's not very, I, I won't say he's not kind. He's not, he's not soft when it right. comes to telling you how he feels about your work. He's going to tell you straight. And yeah. coming from him, it's oh my goodness. So anyhow, he says, yeah, I want you to come. I want you to bring your sketch pad so Neil can see your work. Wow. That's oh my goodness. <laughs> but I was, no, Jesse, I was scared because if he didn't like my work, I, I couldn't survive that. I, I like, this is Neil Adams. He, to me, he was God back then. Sure. But um, so I, and I, I went, I brought the work, and I said, oh, my goodness. I was a very, very shy kid. You can tell I'm very shy, right? But I was a very shy kid, and I, I, I went in there, and I walked as a He wasn't there. He, wasn't, he was like in the back room, but I sat there. And I saw these other artists, like Ralph Reese, and I, I think I can't even remember some of the names of the artists from back then, but I couldn't believe my eyes. And I'm holding on to the next sketchbooks and I'm sitting there. And I didn't I didn't know what to say, so I'm watching TV, just trying to trying to acclimate myself to the situation. And here it comes. Neil come walks in, this big, you know, big dude, and it was him. And he sits down, he's just looking at me. And he goes and he turns the TV off and he just keeps looking at me. And I'm saying, oh my goodness, Howard Chaykin walks in pretty much shortly after that. And Howard makes a beautiful entrance and everything like that. 
And he said, oh, Lewis, hey, do you have your sketchbooks? And he grabs my sketchbooks. And he goes over to Neil, and he's like, kind of like on his knees with my sketchbooks on Neil Adams' lap. And he mm -hmm. said, look, look at this kid's artwork. He's only 17 years old. This when I turned 17. He's only 17 years old. Look, he draws better than I do. And I agreed with that, but I wouldn't say anything like that. <laughs> but I was like so exciting that he was, and the thing is, Neil was looking, then Neil starts to turn. And he keeps looking at me. And he turns almost on every page. He looks at me, looks at me. Then he went backwards, all three sketchbooks. He went forwards and backwards. And, and everybody else in was looking at me like, Neil doesn't do that. No. So then, he says, <laughs> so then Howard gets up and says, yeah, so Neil, I think this kid is great. He goes to get a drink or something like that. So Neil says, you know, Lewis, you know, I like your work very much. Um, you know, this is a series of scripts I've been sitting on for a long time. I couldn't find anybody that I thought could do it, but I think you can do it. Why don't you pick up the continuity uh, tomorrow and I'll get you started on a project. Jesse, yeah. I couldn't do it. I said, oh, okay, thank you. I have to go now. And then I took place <laughs> kids because I didn't know what to do with myself. And I'm walk. I remember it's like 48 or 49th or 48th Street in Madison Avenue in New York City. And I'm saying, you know, Adam just hired me. He looked at my sketchbooks and he hired me. I kept, I'm screaming the top of my lungs. I didn't care if the police were going to, you know, arrest me. I, I was yeah. so excited. So I went in the next day and he showed me this series of scripts called Tippy Toe Jones. What it was, a little cartoony character who lived in a realistic world. And he saw that I could draw both realistically and cartoony, you know, in a pretty good way. So he started me in the project and that was the beginning. And now, you know, we're still really good friends. You know, I, I call him Papa Bear as a matter of fact. But it, but it it was it was from that that moment of being 17 years old the kind of validation that I would never have expected. I, I mean I'm I'm grateful that even though I didn't like how it's work at the time that yeah. I took the job because that's what led me to this icon that you know to this day I still learn from you. And um, to me he's still the greatest comic book artist of all. And what kind of training did you have? I mean it's, at 17, you know how 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 did you become such a good artist? Well, at that point, I did know about Norman Rockwell because I, I discovered Norman Rockwell when I was 16. And the things that I read, see, Mr. Rockwell again, Norman Rockwell and Jim Henson, the two most generous artists of all time, in my opinion, I'm speaking for myself, mm -hmm. because when I first saw Jim Henson, you know, he was, he was talking, he did, he did a film called The Muppets on Puppets, and he told all his secrets even before he was famous. Mm -hmm. Then Norman Rockwell, he was at the famous artist school, and he told everything about how he did his work. He even he even told people he had a Galactica, a tracing <laughs> machine. But no, everybody had one, but he was the only one that came out. And even there's even a picture of him in that book called Rockwell on Rockwell, mm -hmm. um, of him using it. And of course, you still have to know how to draw. You can't just use that's a professional tool, like like a computer is now. The thing is that I really was just so enamored with what Mr. Rockwell did, the things he said. You know, he he would say things like, you know, you have to do whatever you can. To, to get the right things into your studio, no matter what you have to give up outside of your studio, to get the right things in. He was saying things I never heard before that artists, you know, I guess the way artists were supposed to speak, but I never heard any other artists speak that way. Mm -hmm. Looking at, the, at watching up to book and trying to draw the way he did and looking at the way he broke things down, his, his charcoal drawings, I mean, he would show sketches, even his very preliminary rough drawings. I had never seen anybody do that before. So out of his generosity, I just, kept trying to do that. So I kept getting better and better, trying to emulate Norman Rockwell. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm never even get close and nobody ever will. But I'm glad I got as close as I did because Neil saw that. And then again, Norman Rockwell is Neil Adams' favorite artist. So I was able to um, bring as much of that as I could. It, it elevated me. Of course, I was nowhere near Norman Rockwell. But again, you shoot for the moon, you get halfway there, you're still way beyond the earth, right? Yeah. So I was able to get a lot out of um, Mr. Rockwell's teachings. And it elevated my work to the degree that Neil Adams saw that and hired me at 17 years old. That's great. And uh, did you say that you met Jim Henson? No, I just missed him. You know, I, I was in the building two weeks before he passed away. Oh, wow. And I walked because I, I, was, I, was, I was right in front of the townhouse with my son. I'm saying, hey, Mike, let's go in there and so see we can meet Jim Henson. So when I asked, is Mr. Henson? So yes, may I have your name? Uh, Louis Mitchell. Uh, I don't see an appointment. Oh, no, no, I, I didn't have an appointment. I just wanted to see if I could meet Mr. Henson. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Mitchell, but you can't just walk in and meet Jim Henson. <laughs> but I, I had to try. But she said, but you can say, she was a very sweet lady. She said, but you can go, they had this row of theater seats and a giant painting of, of the Muppet Theater. 
the audience section. And mm -hmm. um, so we sat there, we took pictures. It was fun. We, I mean, we, I didn't get to meet him. Then two weeks later, the same day that Sammy Davis Jr. died, they first announced Sammy Davis Jr. And they said, now everybody kind of expected Sammy Davis Jr. to pass away, but yeah. no one expected the death of Jim Henson. Mm -hmm. And I, I literally dropped the coffee cup. I mean, that's one of those cliches that I really did because I wanted to meet him. He meant so much to me. He did so much for me. And that was it. But later on, as time went on, I realized, you know what? I wanted to work for the company. I, when I finally got the job, I said, now that I'm here, I'm going to give my whole heart and soul, the entirety of my heart, to continue the work of this man who was so generous, so great. He considered Sesame Street his most important work. And I'm going to help. To, now, the thing is, I, I didn't know how I was going to be promoted into this position when I'm the creative director of characters. I designed the new Muppets and doing all that kind of work. I didn't know. I didn't care either. I just wanted to know that I was a piece of what he did, what he started. And, you know, he was only at Sesame for, I think, about 20 years. Yeah. Because he died, you know, from 1969 to 1990. So, what, 21 years. Yeah. And, um, and that's about as long as I've been at Sesame and now myself. Well, 20 years yeah. full time, anyway. But it's more like 30 years because I started freelancing in 92. So. Yeah, no, Jim Henson's a big uh, idol of mine, too. Uh, and, uh, you know, reading his biography, he's such uh, a, an inspirational person. It seems like he inspired everyone around him. And I just wondered what, uh, do you still feel his influence at Sesame Street? Like the spirit well, of Jim Henson? To be honest with you, they tend to not bring him up as much as you know i mean again not to fault the company but they are trying to stand on a, a different ground and they're trying to establish a different way of pursuing this but it all came from him i mean mm -hmm. originally there were not going to be any muppets on the show but thank goodness john stone the, the original executive yeah. producer and head writer he recognized you know we're going to need something else so he brought jim in and, um, and because of that, Sesame Street now, it's because of the Muppets that Sesame Street is so, such an international success to this yeah. day. 50, we're on season 52 now, you know, working on that. It's people like me, and there are a few other people in there that, you know, Jim Henson's everywhere. I have my favorite yeah. picture of Jim Henson, is him with Kermit, he's sitting among, amongst a bunch of kids. And I talk about him everywhere. And like yeah. a situation like this, is so I'm so grateful to you. I'm gonna talk about Norman Rockwell, and I'm gonna talk about Jim Henson. And, and um, wherever I go, whatever I do, I tell people all the time, you know. And again, people love Jim Henson, so they want to hear more about it. Sure. And uh, could you discuss, describe a typical day at work for you? No. There is no <laughs> such thing as a typical day, for not for me. For a lot of people, there really are, but yeah. I never know what, what's going to happen. Now, I have a plan, and I have some ideas, and I know usually there's certain projects I'm working on on a regular basis, but something will come out of the blue. Like, you look, I designed Julia, the autism model. I did not see that coming. And you know what? I had already been volunteering at a school for children on the spectrum. I did those sessions for 10 years they had been working on. It's such a precious and special and sensitive topic that it took them 10 years to figure out just how they wanted to do that. I had no idea that was going on, but realizing later on, all that work, I, that volunteer work I did for these kids in their school and at their homes, I was able to bring to this project. I didn't see it coming. So I, I apologize, I can't answer your question. There is no such thing as a typical day. I can give you the structure that I do approach though. I, I'm not supposed to be at work until about 9.30 or so, but I'm usually there, well, before all this is happening right now in the world. I would get there between 7.30, 8 o'clock, sometimes earlier. And I go in there and I kind of do a little bit of a meditation and I just kind of relax. I don't like to rush. I never rush in the morning. I take my time. I might even choose different ways to get to work in the morning because I do want, I don't want to miss anything. And one of the things I did uh, learn, yeah, from Long Rock or from Jim Henson, but mostly from my son. Because I was, I was walking to school one day and there were these morning glories blowing. And he said, hey, dad, look. I said, yeah, nice. that's nice, Mike. He says, no, dad. He yanked me. He said, don't you miss this? So because of that, I am embrace this you know outlook on life so i get in i get in uh, nice and early and i can relax i have my I have a cup of coffee but i go into the music room and i play the piano for about 15 to 20 minutes i try to keep it right around there but every now and then it gets so good that i'll play from 7 30 almost up to 9 30 i will not rob the company of official work time mm -hmm. but so I, I have to at a certain point i didn't realize it i was having such a good time i look at my watch and it's like 25 after nine i said 
Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I had to, I finished up my piece of music and I ran back to my desk, got there right before 9.30. So um, yeah, so I, I do have a little bit of a, I don't call it a ritual. I'll call it just like a, a preparation, you know, mm -hmm. or a cultivation of some kind. That yeah. I can get my creative juices going. I mean, they're always going, but to sit yeah. down and play the piano for a few minutes, even I did, I'll even sketch, I'll even draw. Sometimes I'll go online and find some models that I can draw from or anything. Just keep, because again, as artists, I really believe we have to maintain that. Just like a doctor has to practice medicine, an mm -hmm. artist has to practice art. Look, you saw Norman Rockwell, he went on this trip to Europe and he started doing these sketches of the different parts of Europe. He went to, he went to art classes, not art classes, but he would do the sketch, portrait sketch or something mm -hmm. like that. These people never stop learning. And that's, that's what I, I adopted that, that attitude. So yeah, I, I want to do that. Once 9.30 comes along though, I don't know what's going to happen. I love that. <laughs> I don't love it, love it, love it. Yeah. And uh, Sesame Street now is on, I think it's on HBO Max, right? But it's still- HBO. Uh, it's, on HBO. it's regular HBO. Okay, yeah, and it's it still airs on, on PBS. And I, I guess, how, how important is it to you that Sesame Street is available uh, on public television so that anyone can watch it? Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's yeah. vital really because um, a lot of people don't have access to cable or, yeah. or HBO. So the fact, now the thing is that HBO, I mean, HBO really did a great thing for us. They funded the production of a lot more episodes than we've been mm. doing for a while. Now the thing is they get to air those episodes first, I think eight months, eight or nine months, I guess eight months later, they air on PBS. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that, I mean, it, as long as they get to air, you know, that's the main thing. So it's yeah. important that kids have access to that show. The other thing is that kids also have access to the books. There's a lot of books, Sesame Street books. And that's one of the things I also do. I art direct all the, all the children's books. They spend more time with those books than they do with television shows. So I pour my whole heart and soul into that too. As long as kids have access to Sesame Street, then they don't have to rely on cable or, or even digital content, which I'm glad yeah. we're doing that. You can find this everywhere. But what about the people who don't have internet access? A lot of people don't have internet access. A lot of people don't have cable. But PBS is right there yeah. to, to make sure we always get our feed on Sesame Street. That's great. Thank you so much, Lewis. And, uh, and thank you for all, of, all you do to bring so much joy and magic to uh, children and adults alike. Uh, you're doing such a great job. Thank you. It's a privilege and honor. And I am grateful. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Really, really great. Grateful. Well, for more information, check out sesamestreet.org for games, uh, videos, and art projects, and our own websites, nrm.org, illustrationhistory.org, and uh, visit the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies at rockwell-center.org. And don't forget to subscribe for the latest content. And uh, that's it, Lewis. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. To watch the video of this podcast or to see the images referenced in this episode, please visit nrm.org slash podcast. New episodes from the Illustrator Studio are released every Monday. For questions or comments, please email us at podcast at nrm.org. <laughs>